happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Ways to Walk, and it's time for our weekly Bible study. And today we are going to be going over the account of Lazarus' uh, resurrection and all the things that that led up to um, after that miracle. But before we get started, a little bit about this Bible study. I host a weekly Bible study every Friday at, on Race to Walk, and then I upload that later to um, Race to Walk on YouTube. Now, we're going through the One Year Chronological Bible, and if you want to follow along with that, you can go to racetowalk.org and do a search for a One Year Chronological Bible, and it'll tell you about the reading plan and how you can get a copy of the physical Bible, or if you want, you can follow along with the um, with on you version and they have a reading plan there this the reading is going to be mainly from our 19th and, tw and a little bit from 20th now this is again this is in the chronological Bible they piece it together like when they think things um, the order in which things occurred the way they arrange this it starts when it leads into um, into the resurrection of Lazarus it starts with the teaching about forgiveness and faith in Luke chapter 17. Now I want to make, um, this isn't how the chronological Bible arranges it, but one of the things that um, my mom has pointed out about Lazarus's miracle is that when the, um, the Roman centurion came to Jesus and wanted them to heal his, his child and, and Jesus was going to come with him, and Jesus, or the centurion said, no, you don't, you don't even have to, to come, you just say the word, and he will be he will be healed. He said, "I'm under authority, and if I say something, it's done. I know that you have authority, and that if you say it, it will be done." And Jesus marveled. There isn't faith like this in all of Israel. And so my mom noted that in in that account that that faith of this Gentile actually it was like the seed of faith, and that there was a buildup of miracles after that. And I've noticed, this is just before we get into our reading, I've noticed that sometimes, um, I was just talking to somebody today about this, I used to be in a, in a prayer ministry where we prayed for healing, and we've, the thing about praying for healing is that when you pray for somebody and you see something healed, you have faith for the next thing. So the more things that you see, the more prayer that you see answered, then your, your faith builds up. So if you've never even and never seen a miracle don't even even if you're a christian you don't think that it's possible for for miracles to happen you know when you start to see them happening then you you start to have faith for for more miracles and for bigger miracles and one of the things that we saw um when we were praying for healing is that certain things when people would come in for certain things we just it was almost a given that they would be healed because we had seen it happen so many times and so I think part of it is that we had faith for it. We had faith for those healings. So we know that when I read this in, um, a couple weeks ago, that in Jesus' hometown, there was such unbelief. There was such a block of, of disbelief and doubt that Jesus could only do minor miracles, just heal a few people. He couldn't heal. He couldn't do the major miracles. So this, this, uh, this faith of this centurion that, he said, just say the word and I know it will be done. It was like that was this this little buildup of faith. And then as you, in, in that account, you saw this, this buildup of greater miracles until it came to Lazarus' resurrection. But the way that the chronological Bible has it has it ordered, it starts in, um, the, the buildup they have to it is in Luke 17, 1 through 10. And it says, and he said to his, this, this, he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should they, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung about his neck and he were thrown into the sea, then he should offend one of these little ones. He's talking about the, the children that were coming to him. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he has come in from the field, 
Come at once and sit down to eat. But will he not rather say to him, Prepare something for my supper, and gird yourself, and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. So likewise, when you have done all these things which you are commanded, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done what is our duty to do. So whenever we're you know, doing what Jesus commanded us to do, we shouldn't think, okay, we're awesome. We're these great Christians. It's like, this is, this is what we're supposed to be doing. This is what we said that we would do when we, um, when we decided to follow Jesus. So the next passage that goes to, this is in uh, John 11, 1 through 37. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and his sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sister sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. These things he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. And then his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get well. However, Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes I was not there that you may believe. So it's interesting that the Chronological Bible puts um, that passage in Luke right before it. It says, increase our faith, right? So this is something that uh, they had been with Jesus for probably a few years by this, at this point. They had seen all these miracles going on, but they had, and they had seen, he, they had seen him raise people, right? There was little, the little girl, um, I think there was another one too, but we'll see that this was way beyond anything that they had they had seen before. And then he says, Nevertheless, let us go to him. Then Thomas, who's called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go that we may when I read it, I kinda think, you know, Thomas see Thomas is just throwing his hands, Okay, let's just go die with Jesus. I mean let's let's go and get it over with. I mean, can you imagine what it would have been like to be um tra traveling with Jesus as one of his disciples and then you know he's he's butting heads with the religious leaders. He's going into places where they, they he knows that the the Jews like want to kill him. Um, he's he's really not pandering to the wealthy people of influence. I mean, just think how like what how kind of off kilter that would make you like because he's he's not acting in the expected ways. So anyway, so when Jesus came, he found that, that he, Lazarus, had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she saw that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I... Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, she is going to the tomb to weep there. 
Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then Jesus, the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have also kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been there dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And he who died came out back. Oh, I'm sorry. Now when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. And then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things that Jesus did. So the first time I read this, and this is part of the reason why I chose this passage, the first time I read it, it said, but some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them. So I kind of like wonder the motivation there. So were they excited and like, okay, this is really awesome. Let's go tell the Pharisees so they know that, you know, Jesus is the one who they've been waiting for. Or did they go to, to like cause trouble and stir things up? I'm just, I'm not really not quite sure like where, what their motivation was. But this was, this was their response. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So here's the thing about the Roman Empire. They were pretty tolerant about um, other religions. So they, the Romans were very religious. They had their you know official religious cults. But... The Jews were allowed to continue. They didn't force them to follow their state religion. Um, the, the Jews were allowed to continue, you know, worshiping at the temple and offering their sacrifices as long as they, they made a sacrifice for the Roman em the emperor, you know, asking God to bless them. So they pretty much let them alone. But when there was any sort of revolt against the Roman Empire, they came down like a hammer. I mean, they were just... They squashed it with no mercy. And so, um, actually, this in the account of Jesus' birth, when it, it refers to this, this census of Kyrnus, the, the, he's saying the one before you know he was governor in uh, Judea. So there was a census in 680. It's not the census that was taken when Jesus was born, but there was a later one. And the Jews revolted for that and that was like a huge crackdown and so that was the one that was the really big one that was in everybody's memory but so they're con they're concerned about that and they have the zealots that are like you know stirring up trouble and um that was now in general i don't really like the son of the son of god movie but i think that was one thing that they portrayed really well that um the the one that that jesus took the place of barabbas it was barabbas um he was, they portrayed him as somebody who was listening to Jesus, but he wasn't radical enough for them. And so he, you know, turned away from him. I thought that was kind of an interesting portrayal. But, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing because they say that they've been, they're waiting for the Messiah. They're looking for someone. But what they're worried about here is that the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. So they don't really have faith either, do they? They think that the the Romans are more powerful than than God and his promises because and again, it could be that that they had pride and they didn't want to acknowledge him as the Messiah. It could be 
it could have been fear. I mean, it's hard to really, it's hard to really know, like, really what the motivations are. But anyway, I'm going to go on. And I'm going to go, go back to this. And one of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Okay, so like, let's listen to this. So he's, again, you know, they've been saying that they've been looking for their promised Messiah. They've, um, you know, there were, there was this expectation that the Messiah was coming because of the dating from Daniel. And he goes and he raises someone from the dead who had been dead for days. There's all these witnesses to this. And the response is, we're going to kill him. So, anyway, so therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, and there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? Will he not come to the feast? And both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where he was, he should report it that they might seize him. So um, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. It, it goes into the next part of it. It goes into the next sections are the ten healed of leprosy, the coming of the kingdom, and um, the story of the persistent widow. That's how they have it arranged. But I just want to talk about this for a little bit because. We can we can look at this and we're like, what was what was going on, what was going on here? And it's just I think that we can look at that and we can say, okay, he was he did all these miracles, and he was so obviously something special, right? How how could they miss it? And but I think that sometimes we don't recognize just how easy it is to deceive ourselves because and I'm going to tell you the story I am um, I had a few years ago I was involved in something I think I've mentioned it on my Bible study if uh, Bible study a few times we have a lot of like shady things going on in our school district and it was a few years ago is when I some things happened that actually kind of made me realize what it was and so you know there were a group of people that were you know going trying to make people aware of it and trying to get people to participate in the election and vote so these people that we think are shady could be voted out and what i discovered there was that number one people are so busy with their own lives they don't really care about a lot of times they don't care about what's truth and what's not i mean they don't unless if it affects them directly they they don't care enough to make an effort sometimes even to listen the other thing that i discovered is that it really doesn't take much to corrupt people at all like just somebody giving giving them a contract or not even that sometimes it doesn't even have to do with money you just give them a little attention and give them like a label on a committee and that's all it will take to flip somebody and to corrupt them i mean it's just so 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 discouraging and so after all of that and I, after the election, it was such a disappointment, and I, I came back, and I started going back in and reading for some of, my, some of the things in my apologetics program, and I had been researching the dating of Jesus' birth, and I came across this, a mention of this book called The Later Heritage by Stuart, Stuart Perwin, and um, so it's really, it's out of print. It's this old book. I don't know if you can see it. It's like, I ordered this on Amazon. It was, a uh, library was getting rid of it. This came from Council, County Council of Dunbarton. I think this might be in England or something. I'll have to look that up. But anyway, I read this book. And what it's talking about is that the Herods that came after Herod the Great. All the little power plays that were going on. So we see, we read in the Gospels about... Um, and the book of Acts about what's coming from the viewpoint of the apostles and um, 
you know, their their view and their picture and what, what they saw. This is actually talking about what was going on politically. And it's just, you know, after I read this book, I realized, you know what, it's, you know, what I had experienced, what I had experienced, what I had witnessed, just the passivity, the just not caring, you know, just the, the petty corruptions and self-centeredness. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Nothing's changed. That is exactly what is going on. That was exactly what's going on in the time of Jesus. So the question isn't really, why didn't they see it? I think what we should really be asking ourselves is if, let's just say, we, Jesus' second coming isn't going to be like his first, but let's just imagine it was. If Jesus were going to come in that way today, would we recognize him? Would we recognize him? Would we be somebody that's going in and listening to him and being willing to, you know, be baptized? And John the Baptist said, you know, be baptized and admit that you're sinners. Would we be willing to, and are we willing to, just, you know, give up that social status, go against the, the crowd, go against the grain, you know, get rub people the wrong way, you know, that don't want to, want to, you know, listen? But do we be willing to do that? And are we willing to do that? Because, you know, it's it's the same thing. It's just, we don't see it as we think we would recognize it, but I I don't think that a lot of people would. Even people who say that they're Christians, who confess Jesus as Lord, I honestly I think they'd be right there with the Pharisees because you kind of see that today as far as just in some, you know, petty politics that where things really even aren't so much at stake. They would rather, you know, sacrifice their integrity and the, and bla basically blaspheme the name and the character of God by claiming that he approves certain things versus saying, you know what, that's just not right. I mean, people aren't even willing to stand up for that today when there's no cost. So really, is there any difference? There's not. There's really not any difference. And so I think that when we read this, we should really do, you know, see ourselves in that and, and do some reflection on not only what would I do in that situation, but what am I doing today? What kind of choices am I making today? So the other thing is that I, I want to point out that sometimes, not sometimes, God is always working out things that we don't see. He's always working th those things out. And I just want to share this because uh, this is something that um, somebody shared to me. I was at HBU. We have this little coffee time with um, with the people in the biblical languages group. And this guy came in. He said that he knew people that were um, Jewish people who believed in Jesus. And like, I know Jewish people who believe in Jesus too. But he's like, no, he's like an Orthodox Jew. And I'm like, an Orthodox Jew? Are you, are you sure? I mean, like, are, do you mean like a Messianic congregation? He said no. Like, he goes literally. This is in Houston. He goes to an Orthodox synagogue here in Houston, and he is an undercover believer in Jesus, like Nicodemus. So I think that's really exciting. I think it's exciting that you know more and more Jews just every day are recognizing Jesus as their Messiah. And anyway, I hope you guys have a wonderful week, and I'm praying the, the blessing and the favor of God over you. See you next time.